Right. Yeah, can we turn down? Can we dim the lights? I have some thanks of my own on behalf of all of us uh, for this uh, great uh, uh, experience that we've, uh, that we've had. So uh, uh, first the academic organizers, Joe Carroll, David Rose, and uh, Pat Parker, who represent the areas of English, economics, and uh, biology that uh, have put together this feast for us. So let's, uh, let's have another hand for them. And I can tell you, uh, when you think of the difficulties of bringing in fields such as English and economics, each very different from each other, that's quite an achievement. Uh, so um, so uh, hats off to them. And then our administrators, uh, Debbie Baldini and uh, Ron uh, Yasmin, so let's have a hand for them, because we can't do this kind of thing without administrators. And uh, Debbie, where are you? No, there she is. I have come to know you as mother, so hi, Mom. You've taken, you've taken very good care of us during this, uh, during this um, um, workshop. Okay, so I like to say that there's uh, three waves of uh, evolutionary thought. This is the, the wave that uh, uh, most of the world knows, the theory that organizes the biological sciences. Uh, this is the wave that we know and have been feasting upon during the last few days, the theory that can organize the study of our own uh, species. And this is a wave that's largely in the future, a theory that can be used as a practical toolkit to improve the quality of everyday life. And that's the territory that I've been exploring for the last five years at two scales. One is my hometown of Binghamton, New York, which I decided to use as a field site for basic and applied research on human behavior. So uh, there's Gombe Park for chimps, there's the Galapagos Islands for Darwin's finches, and there is Binghamton, New York for the study of modern human life. And then the Evolution Institute, which is the world's first think tank for formulating public policy from an evolutionary uh, perspective. Our goal is to connect the world of evolutionary science to the world of public um, policy. Uh, but before I get to that, I'd like to make a few reflections on this, uh, on this conference. Um, uh, Massimo Piglisi uh, did us a big favor, I think, in his talk. Uh, and he reminded us that consilience is a word uh, which, with a meaning in philosophy, and we should not forget its original and continuing meaning within philosophy, which was then given a second meaning, uh, meaning by Ed Wilson in his book. And if you look at Wilson's treatment, closely read what Ed said in his book, it is perhaps the case that he placed an undue emphasis on physical reductionism, one of the points that Massimo made in his talk. But there's a more limited idea, which uh, we can call congruence, which involves achieving consistency among uh, disciplines. And it's arguably the case that the, uh, the disciplines that comprise the physical and biological sciences are more congruent in this sense than the human-related disciplines, which need to become more congruent, so on and so forth. I think that many people at this conference, myself included, have congruence in mind when we speak of uh, consilience. And uh, Massimo's critique of consilience, I think, uh, does not extend to uh, congruence. And uh, in my conversation with Massimo in the very stimulating discussion that we had at dinner after his talk, I think that's what he said. And of course, he's free to disagree because he's still here and he loves to disagree. So, uh, and an example of the need for congruence was given by uh, Bob Frank in his talk where he showed that economic theory is centered on the concept of absolute individual utility maximization, whereas evolutionary theory is centered on the concept of relative fitness, which Bob described as life graded on a <coughs> curve. This is at such an elementary level, and something that happens again and again and again when two fields come together and they're compared for congruence, that there's some difference is discovered at a very, very elementary level. I like to call this an evolution 101 insight. There can be no more elementary insight that evolution is based on relative fitness. That was actually an insight, one of the main contribution of G.C. Williams in his classic book, Adaptation and Natural Selection, was to remind his biological colleagues that evolution is about relative fitness. 
And if you get a giant field such as economics, which is centered on the idea of absolute fit and utility maximization, and it comes up against evolution with its emphasis on relative fitness, something's got to give, and it won't be evolution. And so this is the kind of need for congruence which Bob highlighted in his talk. Now, in this case, the modifications need to take place in economic theory. But in principle, when we compare disciplines, uh, that might force changes in evolutionary theory because the evolutionists don't have it all right yet. And I will give an example of this uh, very uh, shortly. Now, the concept of congruence can be articulated without reference to evolution. It's a virtue to, to take any two disciplines and compare them for consistency uh, without ever mentioning the E word. But the pursuit of congruence uh, leads to a consideration of evolution in two ways. I think there's a sense in which all roads lead to evolution when we uh, attempt to achieve congruence. The first is, is that humans are a product of genetic evolution. And so if you make any statement about people, their individual psychology or their bodies, their physical bodies, their minds, or their social interactions, or the cultures that they construct. At some point, that's going to have to lead to uh, humans as a product of genetic evolution. And Joe's work, among many others, I think, is a wonderful example of how we're trying to make, he is trying to make literature more congruent with um, the facts of, uh, of, uh, of humanity based on genetic evolution. But the second reason is, is the human capacity for open-ended change. And when you look back, and then we're all familiar with this, so this is not news for any of us. Or why, is, why is there a large body of people who think that they can do their work without reference to evolution? It's because of this um, um, bipolar, uh, dichotomous way of thinking where we associate evolution with genes, with biological determinism, that's over here. And over here, we have our open-ended capacity for learning and culture, uh, which somehow lies outside the orbit of evolution so that we can study that without reference to um, evolution. And as soon as we begin thinking about open-ended learning and culture as something which not only evolved by genetic evolution, which everyone must agree upon, but also is an evolutionary process in its own right, such that we can study cultural diversity using the same toolkit as biological diversity, then the whole main body of thought that has been lying in the minds of people outside the orbit of evolutionary theory is brought inside the orbit of evolutionary theory. And we can begin to see this um, as a uh, as an evolutionary process in its own right. And there's a lot of work that's required for that. So smart people such as Massimo, my, my, uh, my uh, famous um, opponent, and who's just as qualified as I am as an evolutionist, uh, we have uh, big points of disagreement about what counts as cultural evolution. The idea of memes, that there's, if, if, there's, if there's cultural evolution, there needs to be something like genes. Let's call them memes. That actually might not be true. It might, it, might be the, it might be the case that there's such a thing as evolution without replicators, even for genetic evolution. And so there's a lot of foundational work that needs to be done. But at the end of the day, if it turns out that culture is a process of evolution that can be studied using the same toolkit, and we can think about cultural diversity in the same way that we think about biological diversity, then that's basically going to bring just about everything inside the orbit of evolutionary uh, uh, thought. So what is this evolutionary toolkit? The quickest way that I know to summarize it is with uh, the uh, famous four questions of Nico Tinbergen in a famous article published in 1963 called The Methods and Aims of Ethology. He did this for the field of ethology, but it has become a summary article for any field in biology. And very simply, that anything that evolves requires four explanations to fully understand it. One is its functional, um, its function, if any, so ultimate causation. Two, the physical mechanism that evolved to cause the function, to realize the function, proximate causation. Three, development, how did the, how did the trait in the adult organism uh, um, develop? And our prize winner in, in, uh, in uh, the social sciences is about the development of altruism in children. And then finally, phylogeny, which in the case of uh, cultural evolution is history. And that's why Peter Turchin's contribution at this workshop 
is so important. If you can answer all of these four questions for either a, a genetically evolved trait or a culturally evolved trait, you will have a fully rounded explanation of that, uh, of that uh, uh, trait. And so part of thinking of cultural evolution as a evolutionary process is that evolution as a whole, the core subject of evolution, has to become less gene-centric. And I can tell you from my own experience, and I'll bet that there's experience of the biologists in this audience, that evolution is a gene-centric subject, even for professional evolutionists. So you say the word evolution, and they think genes. But of course, Darwin knew nothing about genes. Darwin knew about heredity. So when we talk about evolution, the three pillars of evolution, it's variation, selection, and heritability. Offspring, in some sense, must resemble, must resemble parents. And genes provide one mechanism of heredity, but there are other mechanisms. And uh, a wonderful book by, uh, called Evolution in Four Dimensions by Eva de Blanca and Miriam Lamb should be on everyone's reading list. When I teach evolution at the upper undergraduate level, this is the first book that I assign because it talks about evolution in general terms. First is a domain general process. What can we say about evolution without knowing anything about the mechanisms of heredity? Only knowing the fact of heredity without knowing any of the mechanisms. And then when we study the mechanisms, then what's it like to study genes as one mechanism and for there to be other mechanisms? Uh, in this book, they outline three additional mechanisms. One is epigenetics, which is transgenerational change caused by the differential expression of genes rather than changes in gene frequency. And we're discovering more and more examples of a resemblance between parents and offspring based on epigenetic mechanisms. And of course, within a body, when cells divide by mitosis within a body, then epigenetics is responsible for all of the differentiation that takes place in our cells. And that's transgenerational too within the body, What's new is that we've discovered that, that transgenerational changes by epigenetics also takes place across, the, across generations through the germline as well. That's, um, that's uh, what's relatively new. And then we have two additional mechanisms of inheritance, open-ended learning in many species. Basically, this is the Skinnerian tradition and what B.F. Skinner calls selection by consequences. The idea that many organisms are basically responsive to, uh, to vary a variation in selection process in which they behave any which way. And some behaviors are selected, not just by natural selection, differential survival and reproduction, but by reinforcers, basically instincts that evolve to do the selection, to winnow out traits that on average will be adaptive from a uh, biological perspective. And then number four, forms of symbolic thought that are largely restricted to uh, humans. And it's the human capacity for symbolic thought that gives us a degree of phenotypic plasticity and cumulative uh, cultural change that is unrivaled among other species. And I think it's a distraction to ask whether this exists somewhat or not at all in other species. I'm very happy to, to admit other species into the symbolic thought club. So, uh, but uh, who could doubt that, um, that um, our capacity for symbolic thought is uh, as um, orders of magnitude greater than, uh, than other species. And so uh, here's a, uh, a classic paper by B.F. Skinner looking here uh, for all the world like an alien from another planet uh, called Selection by uh, Consequences. Let me just read it. It's the abstract of this paper. Selection by Consequences is a causal mode found only in living things or in machines made by living things. It was first recognized in natural selection, but it also accounts for the shaping and maintenance of the behavior of the individual and the evolution of cultures. Natural selection has now made its case, but similar delays in recognizing the role of selection in other fields could deprive us of the valuable help in solving the problem which uh, confronts us. There is a fundamental truth to this. There is a sense in which human beings are like malleable clay that gets molded by these forces of selection, including these instincts, these reinforcers that, uh, that evolved. And this has to be an important part of the evolutionary story. And when it comes to congruence, we have to take note of the fact that, that, that the behaviorist tradition was dominant during the middle of the 20th century. And then it got doubly excluded 
First it was excluded by the cognitive revolution within psychology, and then it was excluded by the, by the new science of evolutionary psychology, which made a polarized distinction between EP, evolutionary psychology, and the SSSM, the standard social science model, which was basically centered on the, 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 uh, uh, the blank slate Skinnerian tradition. So the Skinnerian tradition has been doubly excluded. Did it go away? No, not in the least. If you go to the applied behavioral sciences, the people, the psychologists that are actually in the business of changing individual practices and cultural practices, you will find that behaviorism is alive and well and indispensable. CBT stands for Cognitive and Behavioral Therapy. And it's the behavioral part, which is the backbone of cognitive and behavioral therapy. And there's public health versions of this, which basically are, are accomplish change at the, at the level of groups and even very large populations. Whole states can be changed on the basis of these principles. And I actually don't have an example of that in my talk, but in my, in my comments, I'm happy to provide an example of where these clever applied behavioral uh, um, 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 psychologists were able to change the behavior of whole states. We want to know about that, don't we? So this has to be a central part of evolutionary uh, uh, psychology. And then when it comes to symbolic thought as an inheritance system, we can say this. This is all like so basic, it's got to be true. Humans have a nearly unique capacity to create mental worlds that are decoupled from the external world. You can dream up anything and all sorts of stuff that's not out there. But these mental worlds remain connected to the external world in a very important way in terms of what they cause people to do. And so whatever your meaning system is, as an individual or as a culture, there's going to be a, a symbotype phenotype relationship that's similar to a genotype phenotype relationship. And although the production of symbotypes is not unlimited, but it's very diverse, the selection of phenotypes, not so. And so the winnowing process of meaning systems, cultural systems, stories, religions, is going to adapt symbolic systems to their uh, environment. And, and unlike the epigenetic and the learning inheritance mechanisms, which are quite limited in the repertoire of behaviors that can be produced, symbolic inheritance systems have the same kind of combinatorial diversity and therefore the phenotypic diversity of what can arise from them as genetic evolution. And it's for that reason that we really have to be mindful. This is the forest of cultural evolution, not the trees of cultural evolution, their detailed scientific study, but the forest of cultural evolution is that we once upon a time, we were a species with a standard geographical distribution and then something happened that allowed us to spread over the globe and inhabit every climatic region and hundreds of ecological niches each culture having a toolkit and adapting itself to its environment under very challenging uh, conditions. And that this at the phenotypic level was an adaptive radiation comparable to the other major biological adaptive radiation such as the dinosaurs, the birds, and the, and the mammals. That's the forest of cultural evolution. And it's against that background that we have to study the trees of cultural evolution. And so for me, this is an example of congruence forcing change in core evolutionary theory. Core evolutionary theory at this moment is gene-centric. And when we expand it to include other inheritance mechanisms, of course, epigenetics remains thoroughly biological, but the other two, learning and symbolic systems, in order for us to incorporate that into core evolutionary theory, is going to require evolutionists consulting people in the, in the human-related sciences, various branches of psychology and those human-related disciplines most concerned with culture. And that, of course, includes the humanities. The humanities is going to become central to this operation as it is in this, uh, as it is in this uh, workshop. Okay, so back to the second wave of evolutionary thought. Uh, this is what it means to, this is what's happening right now, which is so wonderfully reflected in this workshop, uh, rethinking the academic study of humans, including uh, these disciplines, all at this, uh, all at this uh, conference. 
And now the third wave involves rethinking major public policy issues. So here are some of the things that, uh, that uh, we want to make better. These are things that are important to us and that we want to, we want to make sure they work well. Education, risky adolescent behavior, empowering neighborhoods, the whole, the whole field of economics, concept of evolutionary mismatch, the very important concept that when you take a species adapted to one environment and you put it in another environment, to pick a simple case, what happens when you put a fish out of water? Don't expect it to behave adaptively on land. Evolution would have to take place for that to happen. And so to the extent that we're a species that's like a fish out of water, then we need to know about that. Evolutionary mismatch is one of the most important topics that you could ask as far as current human uh, welfare. Quality of life, how did that field develop? What is it like to have a metric for quality of life, as a, like an economic metric? And how would one go about that from an evolutionary perspective? Nation buildings and failed states. Why is it that social organization, although it wor when it works, it works best at a small scale, and then as we increase in scale, it's progressively more difficult to make it work. So why do we have regions of the world, such as Afghanistan and Africa, which seem to work just so poorly at a large scale? What is it that happened in history that caused the the European nations to function as well as they do? What causes America to function as well as uh, it does? And could America be falling apart? That was the subject of Peter Turchin's uh, talk at this uh, workshop. Evolutionary medicine, the nature of discourse. This is a favorite topic of mine because discourse, of course, is one of the things that's, 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 that's not working um, at this moment, at least in public discourse. What is discourse? One thing it is for sure is a social behavior. And can we take some of our models, including the kind of game theory models that Michael Rose was talking about uh, in, in his talk, and think about discourse as a hawk dove game? What would that be like? And what's happens when the, what happens when the hawks win in a discourse game? Could we even recognize a discourse hawk? And if we could recognize them, should we police them? Is science a form of discourse in which, in which it is like an, uh, 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 game, uh, a game theory, a hot dove model, in which discourse is policed? And could we spread those sorts of norms so that, so that forms of, of discourse which are not policed could be policed and that we could have a higher quality of, of discourse? So what's it like to think of discourse as a social behavior that we could analyze with the current tools of evolutionary theory. And how does that compare to the way discourse has been studied for millennia? Because it has been studied for millennia. That's what rhetorics and all sorts of things are, are all about. When we approach it from a modern perspective, would we reinvent the wheel? Because that sometimes happens. Sometimes when a topic is approached from an evolutionary perspective, it merely reinvents the wheel because smart people have already arrived at the conclusions, even if they didn't use the e-word. That happens. So what would it mean to study discourse from an evolutionary perspective? Uh, perspective. And when we start, when, when I started this five years ago, it seemed bold and, and tenuous that you could actually waltz into a, a public policy era. The first one we picked was education. That we, could, that we this little teensy tiny uh, uh, fledgling institute, could tackle a major policy issue such as education. And actually, so what, what's this? This is something which is just, you know, everyone wants education to work well. Billions of dollars are devoted to it. Hundreds of theories, just like history, right? All kinds of research. And now we're going to come and we're going to, we, we're going to say, okay, we, 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 know, we, we know something that you don't, or at least we can derive something that you don't. And then we've done this for all these other topics. So it seemed bold that we could, uh, outrageous in a sense, that we could do that. But what I've decided for myself after five years is that basically it's no different to tackle a policy issue from an evolutionary perspective than it is to tackle an academic subject from an evolutionary perspective. It's the same operation. There's the same benefits of achieving congruence. There's the same need to achieve congruence. That when you, when you study uh, education or risky adolescent behavior, any of these things from an evolutionary perspective, what you discover are situations just like Bob Frank described for economics, discordances, lack of congruence at the evolution 101 level before you even get to the evolution 501 level, the more sophisticated uh, kinds of uh, 
uh, insights that evolution uh, can uh, provide. The benefits begin accruing right away. It was a default assumption in many people, and including myself when we started, that if this was going to work at all, well, wouldn't years and years of academic research be required before, before you could actually enter the policy world? Wouldn't there be some lag time? And the answer to that is proven to be absolutely not. For the same reason that there's a lag time isn't required for academic subjects. When you begin to study a given topic, academic topics such as religion from an evolutionary perspective, you begin to discover these, these, um, um, the need for congruence and the need to reorganize the information that's already out there from, the day, from day one. And that leads to new ideas, new research programs, new suggestions. Basically, it reorganizes your perception from the very start. And so that suggests new policy recommendations, new policy possibilities from the very beginning. And to explore those policy po possibilities is no less benign than for any other policy suggestion that you that you might make. So there's nothing intrinsically about, about a policy that's derived from an evolutionary perspective that's more problematic ethically than a policy derived from any other perspective. You're simply arriving at the table with a different toolkit. And then, the, and then that's deriving good ideas, which might or may not be true, and then you proceed accordingly. Another important point to make is that so often we imagine uh, a negative trade-off between basic and applied Science. So the best basic science is curiosity driven. We're asking the big questions. It need not be useful immediately. We expect it to be useful down the road. And that the, the people that are trying to solve the problems of the world, uh, they're just doing kind of mundane work. They're unlikely to come up with new basic uh, discoveries. There's no Nobel Prizes for social work. And that turns out to be turned on its head when you approach these things from an evolutionary perspective for the following. Reason. Evolution is all about the relationship between organisms and their environment. Evolution is, is founded upon field studies. If you don't know the relationship about the organism in its natural environment, you can't even get going understanding its properties. And then lab research has to follow upon uh, what you know about the organism in relation to its environment. The work of David Queller on slime molds is an excellent example. Slime molds were selected as a model organism decades ago by John Bonner, among, among others, as a model system for development. Because here was this amazing one-celled creature that goes from an amoeba to a, a superorganism, a collective organism, that actually differentiates into a stalk and, and cells. And wouldn't that be awesome to be able to use that as a model of, of development? But actually, Bonner, as famous as he is, and everyone else at the time, were clueless about the opportunity of that system and the need for that system to be approached from a multi-level perspective or an inclusive fitness perspective. In other words, the dilemma of cooperation and selfishness that was posed by that system. How is it possible for a group such as that to function as a organism? And what was the problems posed by cheating behavior so on and so forth. Those questions were not asked, for the most part, by the thousands and thousands of papers that use this as a model of development. That was an example of naive group selection. It was taken for granted that these were functional groups, and it was simply a matter of the study of using it as a model for development. And another thing that wasn't done was nobody studied the goddamn organism in the field. They didn't even know where they were in the field. And so all of the questions that you would ask about, the, about, the, about the, the, this organism in relation to its environment were not asked until uh, John Strassman and, and, uh, and David Queller and now many others. Now it's become a model organism for multi-level selection or inclusive fitness theory, depend, uh, uh, depending upon your preference for those two um, uh, frameworks. So it's business as usual for evolutionary biology that you have to begin by understanding the organism in relation to its environment but human related research is not like that and if you look at the disciplines that are like that they are sociology and cultural anthropology and those happen to be the disciplines that are most phobic about evolution and remain phobic about evolution in the case of cultural anthropology so the most field oriented human related sciences 
are going to be among the last to take on evolution. But if you take your average psychology experiment, it's done on college students without reference to their everyday lives. And so when you begin to study people from all walks of life as they go about their everyday lives, you're doing field work on our species. So that's the best basic science you can do. And it's also the most relevant science that you can do. And so you have a positive trade-off between basic and applied science. You can truly have your case, cake and eat it too for uh, human-related research from an evolutionary um, perspective. And this solves the notorious silo problem. We all know about the difficulties of interdisciplinarity in the, inside the ivory tower. Those difficulties exist as much or more so when you look at the applied disciplines. Every single problem is studied in a silo manner. So if it's, if it's alcoholism, it's different than delinquency. It's different from this, it's different from, from that. Different research communities, different everything. But when you're an evolutionist, you have a single toolkit that can be used to study any trait in any species. That's what's so amazing about evolutionary biology. And when you just take business as usual, when you start studying human-related topics as an evolutionary ecologist, that's my advantage and my privilege is that I was trained as an evolutionary ecologist. And all I'm doing is employing my toolkit that I learned with hardly any offer alterations at all to human-related uh, topics. And that turns out to be a new model of uh, applied human uh, research. So here I am. This is a... Uh, a uh, article that appeared in Nature about a year ago, and the tenor of this article is like, what is he doing? And we're doing a lot of things, because as I just said, you can use this toolkit for just about any topic that you might want. But uh, the central topic, uh, that uh, the kind of backbone of the Binghamton Neighborhood Project is pro-sociality, as it should be. Uh, I like the word pro-sociality, because a word, the word altruism is a two-dimensional word. There's an element of, of helping others, but there's also an element of individual sacrifice. Uh, Pro-sociality is a nice one-dimensional word. It refers to any attitude or behavior oriented towards others or society as a whole. And we'll be agnostic as the individual cause. If you can do that at no cost, good. And as we've seen, this is uh, the, a fundamental evolutionary problem. Ed Wilson, I think, rightly called altruism the central theoretical problem of sociobiology. And we've seen at this conference how many different talks have, have, have been centered on the concept of uh, altruism. It's also a fundamental uh, practical concern that if you look at the applied human uh, sciences, you find that for problem after problem after problem, if you have prosociality, in other words, if you live in a nurturing social environment, if you live in a prosocial social environment, if your environment is prosocial, you thrive as an individual. And if your environment is not pro-social, you have multiple liabilities. If you could do one thing, and if that one thing was to increase pro-sociality in the real world, you would have made many, many things uh, better. And so how can we measure, analyze, and ultimately um, uh, increase pro-sociality in the real world? Well, measuring it uh, might be simple. Let's just ask them. So here's a survey called the Developmental Assets Profile, which measures both prosociality at the individual level and at the level of the social environment. It it's, uh, was developed by an organization called Search Institute, which is well known. Uh, it's, it, it's framed in terms of external and internal assets. And based on this widely used survey, uh, you can actually measure uh, in the self-report survey the uh, prosociality of the individual, how prosocial the individual regards themselves, and also how much social support they, they say they get from numerous sources, family, neighborhood, school, religion, and extracurricular um, um, activities. So here's totally straightforward questions. Uh, and we give this with the help of the uh, Binghamton City School District to all of the public school students in grades 6 through 12. Well, that's not strictly true because it turns out that on any given day, about a third of the public school students are not in school. But we get as many as we can. And we get your typical bell-shaped curve. So here's, uh, on a scale from 1 to 100, we have uh, 
Uh, some individuals, like our budding Mother Teresa's over here, and some individuals that you don't want to run into on a dark night over, over uh, here. And then we uh, geotag them so that we get the residential locations of these students, and all of this is passed through Human Subject uh, Review Board. So there's, a city, there's the uh, city of Binghamton, and all of those dots, there's two rivers that come together. All of those dots are, are um, the are residential locations of, uh, of uh, Binghamton students. And then thanks to the magic of geographical information systems technology, we can turn that scatter of points into a topographical surface. Focus on the hills and valleys, not the points. These points are the locations of churches. And one of the things we're studying is the, the faith community, the religious and spirituality community in Binghamton. But focus here on the dark hills and the, and the light valleys of Binghamton, New York. These are hills and valleys of prosociality. These are neighborhoods in which, in which uh, uh, self-reported nice and, and not so nice individuals are uh, living. And when I show this map to anyone, I'll bet that you're fascinated by this map. If you actually know the city of Binghamton, you'll be fascinated by it even more. Everyone loves a map. Well, and the light and dark correspond to? They correspond to the average uh, prosociality score of, the, of, of kids living in the city. So if you're on a hill, a dark part of the city, uh, the, the, the average kid uh, it scores high in prosociality. And if you're on a valley, the average kid scores low in prosociality. So it measures microspatial distribution in, uh, in, uh, in prosociality. So we can analyze all of this, and, and the most important thing here is to see what is the correlation, and of course, ultimately, the causal relationship between the prosociality of the individual and the prosociality of the social environment. Because the, the one way to summarize the evolution of prosociality, everything that we've been hearing about today, is that the only way for prosociality to succeed as a Darwinian strategy is for those who give to also get. A highly prosocial individual will do just fine if they're paired with other prosocial individuals. But if they're not, then they're likely to suffer because prosociality is vulnerable to exploitation by less prosocial individuals. And so the correlation between the prosociality of the individual and the prosociality of the social environment is the fundamental question as to whether we can explain the, um, the existence of prosociality as a social strategy, either genetic or cultural, as, uh, uh, as, a Dar as something which succeeds in the Darwinian uh, struggle. And yes, we have to cross-validate with other methods. But Peter Turchin made this point. Uh, we can't just rely on one methodology. We need to rely on several. And we've now done a whole bunch. Um, experimental economics games, the famous lost letter method where you drop a stamp address envelopes on the sidewalks and you see who's kind enough to put them in the mailbox. We've, we've dropped letters all over the, the city, uh, measures of physical disorder. We've done measures of holiday decorations as, as natural expressions of prosociality. We've done door-to-door -door survey of adults. This is a door-to-door -door survey of adults representing this little section of Binghamton. And it shows this amazing gradient, which we call the valley of distrust, the degree to which they trust their uh, neighbors. And you can coast from this end to this end in your bicycle in one minute. So this is the degree to which prosociality is varying, the spatial scale at which prosociality are varying. And so the bottom line is that these hills and valleys are real. Yes, there's questions about self-report surveys. But you know, there's so the, the, the individual differences, the differences among people and their propensity to help others is so great that you can just ask them. And they'll actually want to tell you. They'll even want to tell you when they're not prosocial. So this is an obvious individual difference that we're needing to explain. There's nothing subtle about this, although, of course, it can also be uh, subtle. So some of the results, very quickly, is there is indeed a strong correlation between the prosociality of the individual and the prosociality of the individual's uh, social environment. Uh, statistically, those most likely to give are those most likely to receive. And this is the basic requirement for prosociality to succeed. This result amazed me when we, when we got it. The chance that a highly prosocial teenager, we call them high pros, in the city of Binghamton interacts with other high pros 
as the correlation coefficient is considerably greater than the chance of an altruist interacting with a full sibling who's also an altruist in the simple kin selection model. The R value of inclusive fitness theory, when it's, when it's interpreted uh, in general terms, is basically a correlation coefficient between the, the phenotype of the altruist and the phenotype of the, of the, uh, of the recipient. And, uh, and so what this means is, is that there's something, something about human social interactions in a modern day city such as Binghamton is creating this correlation, which is even stronger than the correlation that exists among full siblings in a uh, simple genetic model. And another result is that, is that uh, highly pro-social individuals get their social support from multiple sources, so it really does take a village. The most highly pro-social kids as individuals are nurtured by their neighborhood, their family, their school, their social environment, their, their extracurricular activities, and their religion. So religion contributes positively to the pro-sociality of the uh, individual. So the idea that it takes a village, I think, has real uh, uh, credence here. Now we've heard a lot at this conference about conditional strategies. Uh, most organisms have conditional strategies, and individual uh, humans most of all. And so part of what cultural evolution means, and also psychological evolution, is, is basically most people have all sorts of options, and they're weighing their options, and they're selecting the ones that are, are working for them in their situation. And so I invite you to imagine that you're a highly pro-social person in a low pro-social environment. In Michael Rose's talk, let's imagine that you're a dove among hawks. So what, what are your options? You can leave. You can try to change the hawks into doves. You can turn off your prosociality. Or you can remain highly prosocial. You're welcome to do so. But be prepared to suffer the consequences. And so when we look at that bell curve of prosociality, we're, we, actually we could be looking at some genetic differences. And there is such a thing as a social predator that just is an exploiter and is going to, even in, the, even in the nicest social environment, wants to be a hawk among doves. Those folks exist. But many of the folks that are on the low end of that bell curve are individuals that have, that have basically opted for uh, the third option here. They're perfectly capable of, of, of being high pros, but they've defensively turned off their prosociality because they live in a non-prosocial, a low prosocial environment. And this leads to a very simple policy recommendation, another Evolution 101 insight. The world is full of people who want to make the world a better place, and the way they do that is by encouraging people to be more prosocial. Let's say that you succeeded in doing that. Basically, what you might have succeeded in doing is causing somebody to employ option four rather than option three to their detriment. And so if you're going to do this in a smart way, you better work on increasing the prosociality of the social environment before you encourage people to be prosocial themselves. One way that this has become a phrase is declawing the cat. You take a cat and you remove its claws and you put it back in a state of nature. You have not done that cat a favor. And so we don't want to declaw cats when those, when, when those weapons are needed in their social uh, uh, environment. Now we know that there's many different kinds of phenotypic plasticity. Some operate early in life. As our talk, I'm so eager to uh, talk with the person who won the Social Sciences Award. I actually didn't get a chance to see that poster, so please come and see me. Uh, ample evidence that early, a lot of this uh, phenotypic plasticity plays itself out early in childhood and then may, maybe becomes less flexible later in life. Uh, this began with uh, John Bowlby's attachment theory way back in the 60s. He was a pioneer of evolutionary psychology and that field has come a long way. So evolutionary developmental psychology has become quite a mature uh, field. It's well worth um, uh, looking into. So one question that we want to ask is how flexible are you by the time you're a teenager? If you grew up in a harsh environment and then you get transplanted into a, a more nurturing environment, are you capable of changing at that stage of your life cycle? That's simply an empirical question. And then there's another kind of phenotypic plasticity which is of the true chameleon variety that all of us are also capable of, at least to a degree, where we assess our environment right here and now, and then we either consciously or unconsciously match our degree of cooperation to our social environment on an instantaneous, 
almost an instantaneous basis. And those mechanisms could be either conscious or unconscious. And I'm going to quickly prevent you some evidence that there's, that first of all, optimistically, it is possible when you take an adolescent, a teenager, and, change, and put them in a better social environment, that they do respond. You are capable of responding at that stage of your life cycle. And then some evidence for this chameleon variety that exists for uh, all of us. So this uh, survey, we give it every year now. So we're building up a, a, uh, a longitudinal database of unparalleled spatial and temporal resolution. Every year we give the DAP to the students. And, and when we look at this longitudinally, the first time we did this was at a three-year interval. A sizable fraction of the students that were measured the first time had moved within the city of Binghamton and were now residing in a different location the next time that they were tested. And so we can look at their before and after individual prosociality score and we could ask, did they change their prosociality and did they change it in response to their social environment so that if they moved up a hill, they got more prosocial as individuals, or if they moved down a hill, they got less prosocial as individuals. And the answer is that that happened. So if you, if you transplant an individual into another social environment, this is an indication that they will respond as an individual. They still retain uh, phenotypic uh, uh, plasticity. And then the photograph study, which is done with my uh, uh, former PhD student, Dan O'Brien, was to take photographs of neighborhoods of the city of Binghamton and to show that those photographs to college students who knew very little about the city, and then to ask them two questions. First, to evaluate the quality of that neighborhood, and then, and which, we, which we then compared to the responses of, of people who actually live in that neighborhood, and then to play experimental economics games. So it's a college student views a photograph of a neighborhood and then plays a uh, sequential prisoner's dilemma with a student from that neighborhood, and we could actually cause that to go forward because we had played the, the game with students in that neighborhood. And we could pair the response of the college student with the response of someone from that neighborhood. So that was an actual game with real money and all of, uh, and all of that. And the result of that experiment is that uh, you can accurately assess the quality of a neighborhood from a photograph. There is a correlation between the perceived social capital of people living in the neighborhood with those rating the photograph. And Dan and I have done a, a really nice job of kind of teasing apart what is it in those photographs that's responsible for that assessment. And it tends to be things that you can do something about. So if it's a, like a, a street that's cr crummy, then that's not, we don't, we discount that. But if it's a lawn that's unmowed, or a house which is, neglect, which is, which is neglected, then that's, there's information there basically about, about uh, about the people living in the uh, neighborhood. And then, when they're asked to play a cooperation game, they behave like chameleons. Or very simply, if you show them a photograph of a good neighborhood, then they, that puts them in a cooperative mood when they play the experimental game. And if you show them a bad neighborhood, then that puts them in an uncooperative move, and they shut down. Just like a turtle pulling into its shell. And although this is kind of obvious in retrospect, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's worth reflecting upon because what it means is, is that if you're a kid from a bad neighborhood, or for that matter, if you have a personal persona, the way you dress, the way you carry yourself, and so on, that causes somebody to assess you as a tough person, as a, as a dangerous person, as a threatening person, then you are, that, you are gonna see a different human nature basically reflected back upon you before anyone's even said a word to you because we're so responsive. And this is back to the theme that this kind of research is, is the best basic scientific research you can do in addition to being so relevant to making a difference. So this is a nice uh, paper that was published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology on this, on developing the concept of community perception. And just the same way as lots of research shows that we're really good at when I meet you, I've got some great assessment mechanisms for you know, figuring out what kind of person you are. We also do that to our environment to our environment. Okay, so we want to go from, first of all, you need to see this. And the whole concept of taking information and visualizing it, just so that you can see something, the scale of a city, is a huge step. Because you have to see something before you can analyze it or do something about it. And then the kind of analysis that we're doing, and finally, to intervention, 
is, of course, what this is about. And uh, Joe, what's my time? Give me a time check. Okay. And this, this graph represents the kind of stuff that, uh, that uh, Herb Gimtis was talking about. These are these great experiments that are done in the laboratory. In this case, we have uh, a cooperation game without punishment, and everyone stops cooperating. Here we have a cooperation game with, with punishment, and everyone um, uh, uh, cooperates. What this says is that we're able, we know enough to turn cooperation on and off in the laboratory. Uh, no problem, right, in an afternoon. And so, can we use some of these also to turn cooperation on and off in a real world uh, uh, setting? We've heard a lot from Chris Bohm about the ancestral human social environment and the ingredients that those represent. That's just huge. So there's, there's basically knowing what we do about, about our species and how we function in a small group environment is tremendous practical import. And then I want to add this, the work of Eleanor Ostrom, which is just huge. Ostrom won the Nobel Prize in Economics, and I have to, go, I have to uh, stay within my time, so I'll have to go a little quickly here. Basically, the reason that Ostrom won the Nobel Prize is that she showed that groups of people who, manage, who, who are trying to manage their common resources uh, do a pretty good job. They can do a pretty good job. The, the commons need not be a tragedy, but only if certain conditions are met. And the conditions that enable common pool of resource groups around the world, both traditional and modern groups, to actually do a good job of managing their commons uh, boils down to a, a number of design features which are highly congruent with all this other stuff that we've been talking about. So I'm going to quickly list the design features that cause groups to function well as groups. And you will recognize the scientific principles here. It's important for them to, have a, to know that they're a group and to know what the group is about. It's, it's important for there to be proportional equivalent of cost and benefit. It is unsustainable for some individuals to do most of the work and for other individuals to get most of the benefits over the long uh, term. Consensus decision making is huge. People hate being bossed around, but they'll work hard for a consensus decision. It's always the case that some people will misbehave or be tempted to slack or to bully. And so if you can't monitor it, forget about it. When somebody does misbehave, you have to correct it, but that, but you, that should be graduated. It should, be, it should start friendly and low-key, and it should escalate only as needed. And that's where gossip comes in. So graduated sanctions is huge. Fast, fair conflict resolutions. If there's a dif difference of opinion, it ne needs to be resolved uh, quickly and in a manner that's regarded as fair. Very often, that's a meeting of elders, respected people. If you and I disagree, we'll pick someone that we both respect, and we'll let them decide. Uh, for us. Local autonomy. If you can't organize your own group, if that's being dictated from above, then forget about it. And finally, polycentric governments. In a large-scale society, the relationships among groups must, um, must um, abide by the same uh, principles. And so we're in the process of working with Ostrom and others now to generalize these core design uh, principles and to apply them to real-world settings. And it's paradoxical that in some sense our, our ability to behave in functional small groups is instinctive. It is not the case we spontaneously do it whenever we form small groups. The world is full of groups, large and small, which work poorly because they lack one or more of these design uh, principles. And so this enables us to go to real world situations and to actually take groups as they currently exist and make them better on the basis of these design principles. And our first effort to do this in Binghamton was called the first annual Design Your Own Park Competition. It's now in its uh, second year. And basically what it works is we, we, we take the opportunity to create a great neighborhood park in your neighborhood as the common pool of resource. Most neighborhoods don't have a common pool of resource, so we can bring one into existence with the prospect of creating a neighborhood park. And then the group that forms to do that, we can work with them in order to build in the design principles so that they can work more effectively as groups. Here's one of the parks that's being developed. And uh, last week, uh, on last Saturday, I was actually had my rototiller, and I was tilling that area right, uh, uh, right there. And then another thing we have is, uh, is a program for at-risk high school students. This is going to be my showcase example, which I can get through in just a, a minute. So this is a program for kids that have been flunking and are almost certainly going to flunk out, going to, going to leave school, drop out of school if something isn't done. 
And uh, Rick Kaufman is one of my grad students, and Miriam Purdy is the principal of this school. And so what we did was we had an opportunity to design a social environment and to stack the deck in favor of cooperation, just as, as we could stack it as much as we could stack it. And if you look down this list, uh, Eleanor Ostrom's list, and ask the question, uh, how well do most school programs embody these design principles, especially from the perspective of at-risk students, you'll see that they score pretty low. The typical school as perceived by an at-risk student does not embody many of these design principles. Actually, the students that love school, it does embody those principles. School works well for some people. And in addition to those design principles, there's the very important issue of, of a safe versus, versus threatening environment. That fear is, is, is adaptive over the short term for escaping an immediate situation, but it's toxic over the long term for the kind of long term learning outcomes that we're... So if you're going to build a good school system, make sure that it's safe and secure, and also make sure that it's fun. Because nobody, no organism, including humans, learns anything when all the benefits are in the future and all the costs are in the present. If you tell anyone, if you, if you slog through school, you'll get a great job. Just don't, that's just not the way learning works. And so you better make school fun over the short term if you're not going to... Uh, and this is, true for, this is true even for the other end of the bell curve. This is a book by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the famous psychologist who best known for his work on flow, in which he followed a cohort of talented teenagers identified as gifted in the ninth grade. And he asked how many were still identified as gifted as the 12th, at the 12th grade. How many were still fulfilling their gifts? And the answer was only those who liked what they were doing on a day-to-day -day basis, even for the gifted kids. How's that going to work for the non-gifted kids? So we did a randomized control trial. We enrolled twice as many kids as we could accommodate, randomly selected half, and the other half went right back to the high school and were tracked in the normal high school uh, routine. And here's what happened. The kids in the Regents Academy, that's the name of it, they started doing better immediately. By the first marking period, they, they popped up like a cork. And so phenotypically, they responded quickly enough, even though the rest of their lives remained very, uh, very harsh. They responded to this improvement in their social environment by improving their academic performance, which they maintained for the rest of the year. The most, the most uh, rigorous test was the state-mandated exams. And here we have two comparisons for four subject areas. We have how well our kids did, with how well the comparison group did, and how well the average high school student did in the Binghamton City School District. And astonishingly, what we found was that in this social environment that we created, not only did the Regents Academy students vastly outperform the comparison group, they also performed on a par with uh, the average high school student. And when we look at developmental assets, non-academic things, then we find we also have uh, um, uh, improvements in family relations and how well they think about themselves and so on and, and so forth. And this is true for across the board, all ethnic categories, boys and girls, all ethnic categories. So I need to conclude here. Uh, I want to say very briefly, because there is so much more to say, that more needs to be done. I mean, different kinds of studies need to be done to ask how can a city function well as a, as a functional unit? And this comparison that we've been talking about with major transitions, the whole concept that a group can be like an organism, and an organism is literally the groups of past ages. An organism is literally a highly regulated society, is full of implications for how we can take a entity such as this, which is not a superorganism. It's struggling to be one. And what we need to do is we need to manage the cultural evolutionary process so that we could actually cause something like this to be something like this, which itself we are discovering are like those. So three ways of evolutionary thought. And my conclusion is the third wave is a straightforward extension of the other two uh, waves. Every university provides a base of support for this kind of uh, research. It can be conducted without large grants. Almost everything I've told you was done without any grants or with the tail end of grants that were written for other purposes. Every university has resources. Every city has resources. It's a matter of coordinating, getting people with, with whatever resources they have to do, uh, to, uh, do something different. Results in top quality basic scientific research, 
Richly satisfies communitarian desires. I was a slacker before I started to do this kind of research, and I feel that my life is enriched by getting involved in my community. Some people already do, right? But if you don't, and you become involved as a scientist, and if you're like me, then your life will be enriched by basically becoming a member of your, more a member of your community, and contributes enormously to university community relations. We have made a stronger and more profitable tie between our university and our community, which every university strives to do. So administrators take note. This is a very important way to forge a strong university community relations. You can learn more about it at the Evolution Institute. And then finally, with Joe, I want to tell you that this is one of our newest ventures, Evolution, This View of Life, an online magazine, anything and everything from an evolutionary perspective. And so the spirit of this conference is carried forth in the spirit of this um, magazine. And I thank you very much. Yeah.